there's always been a debate about what happens to children when they die. And how about uh, aborted babies? Where do they go when they die? open up in a word of prayer. But God, thank you for the broadcast today. I am grateful for each and every person that's tuned us in. I pray that your words might be instructive, edifying, and be very helpful to all the listeners. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Michelangelo, when he died, <clears throat> he left four unfinished works. And each one of them was very similar. A very large uh, piece of marble, square marble, with an emerging uh, statue coming out the torso up. And, and people would suppose that Michael didn't finish these works, he just didn't have time to do it, so he kind of left them half done. But actually, that's not the reason he left them that way at all. Michelangelo was very much against slavery. And what he was attempting to do was to depict what a slave was going through. He was only essentially half free, and he was emerging from this, this huge, marble stone. What a picture. And may I suggest to you it's a great analogy for the Christian life. The apostles, the 12 of them at this juncture, are like emerging men from a marble stone. Jesus is changing them. But brother, they got a long way to go. They are in the rough for sure. Bible says, 12th chapter of Romans, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The disciples had not yet been transformed by the renewing of their mind. And somebody can say, well, Jack, how do you know that? The last broadcast talked about the disciples attempting to cast out a demon out of a boy. Cruelly demon-possessed, the demon was trying to murder the boy, kill him, threw him in fire, and, and threw him into the ocean, whatever, trying to drown him. And the disciples didn't have God's power to kick one little demon out of one little boy. And when they came to Jesus and said, why couldn't we do it? His answer was profoundly simple. Because of your unbelief. Now friends, self-indulgence does not coincide and go along with faith, powerful faith that moves mountains. The disciples were self-indulgent. They were bickering. They were arguing about which one of them was going to be the greatest. Consequently, they were out of fellowship with Jesus, and when it came to doing anything for the Lord, they just couldn't do it. They had no power to do so. And of course, that's the fulfillment of Jesus' words in the 15th chapter of the Gospel of John. Without me, you can do nothing. So, here we've got these emerging disciples. Jesus got a lot of work to do on them, to bring them to where he wants them to be. But they're coming along, but ever so slowly. Now our story picks up in verse 24 today, and I'm reading. When they had come to Capernaum, those who received the temple tax came to Peter and said, Does your teacher not pay temple tax? And he said, Yes. And when he had come into the house, Jesus anticipated him, saying, What do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth take custom or taxes? From their sons or from strangers? Let me stop right there. The temple tax now was a couple of drachmas, not a big deal. But once a year, these guys from the temple would come by, and everybody, all Jewish people, had to pay that little temple tax. Now they came to, uh, to Simon Peter. And it was a, uh, a critical question. Does not your teacher pay the temple tax? In other words, what kind of a fellow are you following? Is he so poor or so out of it spiritually that he doesn't even contribute to the temple? And so Simon Peter, when asked that question, put his foot in his mouth again because he didn't consult with Jesus about it. All he said was, oh yes, yes, the master pays temple tax. Kowtowing to the Pharisees again, he was very, very concerned about not offending them. After all, he was going to march into Jerusalem very soon with Jesus the Messiah, and he would get the blessing, no doubt, of the Sanhedrin so the kingdom could be set up. 
So he was licking the boots of the Pharisees at this juncture. Well, he went to talk to Jesus about the temple tax. And Jesus, knowing all about the conversation, anticipating what he was going to say, and the answer, the question he was going to ask, said, Peter, I want to ask you a question. The, uh, the temple tax is uh, going to the temple. And is that not God's temple? I'm reading between the lines and adding a little bit, but this is basically what he was saying. Uh, Peter, if, the, if the, 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 son's, uh, the son of the king was, was given the proposition or, or told to pay a temple tax, would he pay it? Well, of course not, Peter would say. He's a son. He's a son of the king. It's his own property. The sons are exempt. Well, the sons indeed were exempt. Now listen to Jesus as he speaks. What do you think, Simon, from whom do the kings of the earth take custom or taxes, from their sons or from strangers? And Peter said to him, from strangers. Of course, you always tax a stranger. <laughs> Jesus said to him, then the sons are free. Nevertheless, lest we offend them, go to the sea, cast in a hook, and take the fish that comes up first. And when you have opened its mouth, you will find a piece of money, take it, and give it to them for you and for me. Now Jesus said, listen, you're absolutely right. We don't owe anything to anybody because that temple is my temple. I'm the God of that temple, and I don't pay taxes. <laughs> and neither do you, Peter. You're a son of God, too. You don't pay taxes. But listen, let's not offend these Pharisees. They're looking for any little thing. They're nitpickers. Any little way to criticize us, let's not give them any way to do that. You go on down to Lake Galilee and you throw in your hook. You're a fisherman. You know how to do all these things. And the very fit first fish that you pull up, you're going to be amazed because it's going to have a drachma in its mouth. And that uh, drachma, I want you to give to those folks and tell them, here's the tax. This is for the master and also for me. Least we offend them. Now, there's a great lesson for you and I here. Number one, Jesus didn't have a drachma in his pocket to give these folks that wanted the temple tax. And the Bible says, for our sakes he became poor, that we through his poverty might become rich. Jesus didn't come down here to amass a fortune. He was poor. He had no money. But God provided miraculously for him. And by the way, for you and I also, miraculously if need be. But the main thought is, let's not offend these people because we only want to offend them for one reason, the gospel message. The Apostle Paul says, giving offense in nothing, that the ministry might not be discredited. The world is looking for reasons to reject Jesus. Let's not give them any. The cross is the most offensive thing in the world to lost people because it demands that they humble themselves and admit that they're sinners. They don't like that. That's not a popular message. But let that be the only reason that they are offended, not for anything else that they do or see in our lives. We are to be blameless, giving cause for offense to no one. Now, chapter 18. Listen to this. This is remarkable. Now, if you think I'm exaggerating about these disciples being a little on the rough side, look at the next question. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus. Notice disciples, plural, not just Peter. The whole crowd came to him, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? They were not asking a theological question that Jesus could answer in a theological way. The question they were asking is, you get to the heart of the issue, which one of us is going to be sitting at your right-hand side, Jesus, as your right-hand man? Who's going to have the largest throne? And who is going to have most control over the millennial kingdom? Will it be me, Peter would think? I walked on water. And John might say, well, maybe you walked on water, Peter, but Jesus loves me more than you. Sorry about that. I think I'm going to be the greatest. These two were jockeying for power. All of them were jockeying for power. Who's going to be the greatest? And what a wonderful opportunity Jesus has to explain to these rough, crude disciples who the greatest really is. Listen to them. This is remarkable. Then Jesus called a little child to him 
and set him in the midst of them and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become like a little child, you will by no means even enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as a little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Let me stop right there. Now Jesus calls this little child, and they loved him. Oh, how they loved him. The disciples were shooing him away. Get these kids away. They're bothering us. We're too important for little children. And Jesus said, boys, kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Who's the greatest? Jesus calls a little humble child standing there, little boy, little girl, we're not sure which. Here are the 12 standing around, slapping himself on the back, congratulating himself and how wonderful they were. And Jesus said, you really want to know who's the greatest? This little child who's humbled himself. Anybody that does that, they're the one that's going to be the greatest. I can't help but think of the story that Harry Ironside talks about. <laughs> this a stern-faced preacher, very sour man, dour. He was in the pulpit speaking about the three times that Jesus wept. And he said, there's no place in God's word, he says, that Jesus ever smiled. Well, that guy didn't smile much. There's no place in God's word that Jesus ever smiled. And a little child who was sitting in the front row of the church couldn't contain himself. Oh, but preacher, preacher, the little child said, that's wrong. Jesus, Jesus smiled all the time. And the preacher says, well, how do you know that? Because the little children came to him and they weren't afraid of him. If Jesus had been like you with a sour face, they would have been petrified of him. They'd never have come to him. That's why I know that Jesus smiled. <laughs> I think that uh, little child <laughs> gave a pretty good message to the preacher that day. In any event, the little child is a wonderful example of true conversion. Unless you become, listen to it now, here's some conditions. Unless you become like a little child and are converted. What did Jesus tell Nicodemus? Unless a man's born again, he can't see the kingdom of God. Conversion and being born again are synonymous. It's the same thing. You've got to be brought into God's family through a new birth. And when you came into the human family through a human birth, you were a little child and you were humble, right? And same way, when you're born into God's family, you come in as a little child and you'll be humbled by God. And he indeed humbles you because you know that you're really nothing. You thought you were somebody important, but God shows you, no, you're not somebody important at all. You're a nothing. The grace of God has brought you into the family of God, and that's what gives you meaning and purpose to life, and that's what gives you identity. <laughs> I was thinking of a, maybe a good story to share with you about conversion, about um, the necessity of humbling oneself before they can actually come into the kingdom. And uh, I thought of a rather radical story, and I'm going to share it with you. It's found in the Gospel of Luke in the... Uh, this will be chapter 23. Chapter 23 of the Gospel of Luke. I'm going to pick up and I'm reading in verse 39. It's the story of the crucifixion. Now, I know that you've heard this story before. Pretty much everybody has, but let's read it with fresh eyes. Two thieves, Jesus in the middle. Remember now, they're both cursing and they're saying ugly things to Jesus, like if you're the Messiah, why don't you come down off the cross and take us down too? Cursing, swearing, blaspheming, both of them were. But then the one thief had a change of heart. He saw the man in the middle that he was mocking and blaspheming one moment, praying for the people who had just crucified him, and saying things like, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. This was astounding. This was miraculous. There was nothing, nothing even remotely human about what Jesus was doing. It was all supernatural. And he recognized that. He changed his mind about Jesus. And look what he says, verse 39. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other, answering, rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God? seeing you were under the same condemnation. 
and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. And this man has done nothing wrong. What a revelation. Don't you fear God? You're going to die in an hour or two, man. And here we have one crucified in our midst between us, and he is doing things that ordinary men cannot do. He's praying for his enemies. This is convicting. Not to mention the fact that people at the base of the cross were saying, sure, this man was a son of God. And so this man changed his mind. And what did he change his mind about? Here, by the way, is a wonderful picture of what true repentance is. He changed his mind about Jesus, that he was not just a other criminal. And, and he says to the other criminal, look, at, we're dying, we're dying because of our own stupidity. This man, he has done nothing wrong. Good possibility that he had heard Jesus maybe at the Sermon on the Mount or maybe some other message and maybe observed him chose not to receive him as savior, chose to disbelieve, go on in his criminal activities. But now he's had a change of heart. He recognizes, number one, that he is sinful. He has broken the commandments of God. And what is happening to him on the cross is truly just. Now that, folks, is a huge revelation. If you don't think so, you ought to see the statistics of uh, people in prisons like Rayford or other prisons, ask the, the prisoners if they really deserve to be there. You would be astounded how many innocent people there are in jail, about 98% of them. <laughs> Only about 2% will admit that, yeah, man, I deserve to be here. The rest of them, I was railroaded. Well, sir, it's a very humbling experience to die. Could there be any more humbling experience than that? But the other thief didn't be humbled, wasn't humbled, didn't change his mind, and died and was separated from God and is to this very hour. But this man, no, he turned to Jesus, and all he said was, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And then we find the most remarkable statement, one of the most remarkable statements in the word of God. Jesus turned to him and said, this day, this day you're going to be with me in, in paradise. The man was saved, hanging on the cross moments before he died. He was born into God's family humbled himself, recognized his violation of the law, turned to Jesus as the cure. The law had done its work. The purpose of the law is to bring us to Christ. The law did its work. God opened his eyes to his sinfulness. He turned to Christ by faith like a little child. Humble like a little child, submissive like a little child, now relying on the Savior like a little child would. Well, that's quite a story, is it not? Well, let's go on back to the 18th chapter. There's a picture of conversion. Now listen to this now. Whoever receives this little child like this in my name receives me. We're going to discover in the rest of this chapter the significance of little children. When you receive a little child, it's just like receiving Jesus. When you reject a little child, you're ugly towards him. That's like rejecting Jesus. Wow. Listen to this now. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him that a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of offenses. For offenses must come, but woe to that man by whom the offense comes. Well, <clears throat> very interesting. The Lord Jesus is now going to give us the significance and the importance that he places on little kids. Don't do anything that causes little children to be offended. You might as well have a millstone hung around your neck and dropped into the bottom of the sea. Like he said at one occasion, it's better that man if he's never even born. You know, there's two things that offend little children in this age we're living in. Maybe it's always been basically this way to one degree or the other. But I can think right off the bat of two things that are extraordinarily offensive. And what causes little ones that believe in Jesus to be offended? The first is pornography. Now, uh, 40 years ago, you would have to go into a, a store to buy a dirty magazine. You wouldn't see it on television. You'd never, never get it in literature that comes through the mail. But now there's something 
different, a different scenario entirely. Little kids, seven, eight, nine years of age, walking around with cell phones in their pocket, connected to the internet, push two or three buttons, and see all those filthy pictures. The statistics are shocking. How many nine and 10 year old boys are watching pornography on their phones? It's shocking. God help anybody that's involved in any way, shape, or manner in the pornography industry that causes little kids to stumble. God help them. I remember years ago, not that many years ago, there was a pornographer by the name of Larry Flynn, and he uh, was the publisher of uh, a magazine called Hustler, a pornographic magazine. And he came in contact with a very well-known evangelist, and the evangelist shared the gospel with him, which, of course, was exactly the right thing to do. And uh, he made a big profession of faith, and it was splashed all over the news. The pornographer got born into God's family, the, the headline said. Larry Flynn, the publisher of, uh, of uh, Hustler magazine. But he didn't uh, get rid of his business. He didn't sell it. He didn't uh, fold it up. He continued on publishing pornography. But four or five months after his so-called conversion, somebody asked him, don't you see a contradiction, Larry, between you being born again and also being involved in the pornography industry? His answer was quite enlightening. He said this, I want to be the best born again pornographer in the world. Well, he may be a pornographer, and indeed he is if he's still alive, but he's not born again. You know why I know that? Listen to the next verse. Listen to this. If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands and two feet to be cast into the everlasting fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out, cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life one, with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. In other words, don't let anything stop you from going to heaven. If your eye offends you, pluck it out. You've got an empire, a pornographic empire, Larry. Hustler magazine, multimillionaire. Get rid of it. You're born into God's family. You want to serve him. Has God done something wonderful for you, given you the gift of eternal life? And all that stuff is garbage, and you'd get away from it immediately if you were truly born again. The problem is he wasn't at that juncture. I hope he got saved sometime after. I'm thinking of the man that wrote this book, Matthew, the uh, tax gatherer, the, the mafia-type guy. Well, Jesus called him. Matthew, I want you to follow me. You know what he did? He walked away from his customs desk, the place he collected money unlawfully. He walked away from it because he found something of far greater value. To know Jesus is priceless and anything else is garbage. And if you're hanging on and thinking, as Larry Flynn was, I don't want to trust Christ. If I really trust him, it's easy to say you trust him, but if you really do trust him, I'm going to have to leave my pornography behind. That's right, you're going to have to leave your pornography behind. Well, this is what Jesus thinks of children. And this is what he thinks of anybody that would offend them or hurt them in any way. They are precious to him. Listen to him now. Take heed, this is verse 10, that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you, that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to save that which is lost. Do not offend little ones. Listen, they've got guardian angels, and I think that's what that means. I wouldn't want to be dogmatic. They're guardian angels in heaven looking at the face of God the Father. You're offending these precious little children by by being involved in, in pornography, something that despicable and evil that destroys little kids' lives, destroys marriages, destroys families, responsible for hundreds of thousands of divorces, 
You want to be responsible for that? Breaking up of homes? How sad, how pitiful that people would make money in such a wicked, evil, despicable way. But they do. It's the biggest business in the world, pornography. The biggest business bar none. Bigger than GM, bigger than the oil, bigger than anything. They say there's 5,000 pornographic sites on the internet alone. 5,000. Very dangerous. That little cell phone can be very, very dangerous in the hands of a child. Look at verse 12. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine and go to the mountains to seek that one that is straying? And if he should find it, assuredly I say to you, he rejoices more over that sheep than over the ninety-nine that did not go astray. Even so it is, even so it is not the will of your Father, who is in heaven, that one of these little ones should perish. Now I want to say a couple of things here. First thing I want to say is, I gave two great reasons that little kids are hurt and offended. Two major ones. Now, of course, child abuse is horrible. We know that. Uh, the sex trade is horrible. Little kids kidnapped and using the sex trade. That's disgusting. That's horrible. Abortion is horrible also. You know, there's a woman by the name of Abby Johnson, and she was a... Um, she was the one that ran a abortion clinic for eight years, Planned Parenthood in a certain state. Eight years, and uh, one day a doctor came in with a new tool for uh, causing abortions. And uh, he wanted to show her how it worked. So he brought something into the clinic that normally wasn't allowed in there, a sonogram. And he took the sonogram live, and a woman who was three months pregnant and inserted this instrument into the woman with a live sonogram showing how to abort the baby. She had never seen one before, even though she ran the clinic for eight years, Abby Johnson had never seen a sonogram of an abortion. She was horrified as she saw a three-month-old baby attempting to avoid this, this instrument of death. The baby was thrashing around trying to avoid this thing. It was horrifying as she watched this baby die. After that one incident, she a week later, she walked out of that clinic and never went back. Never went back. She'd never seen anything like it in her life. Sonograms can be very useful in revealing the truth. Listen, do not separate born children from unborn children because they're all God's children and they're all innocent. I remember years ago talking to a hardcore guy that believed so much in abortion. And I started off, he was a Jewish man. And I said, listen, the Holocaust was horrible, right? He said, eh, horrible, are you kidding me? Why, well, Hitler was the worst man in the world. Yes, he was. He was a disgusting man. And he murdered not just women and children, he, anybody, elderly people, anybody he didn't like, he murdered, but mostly he picked on the Jewish people. Six million of them in the Holocaust of Germany, the death camps. And I said to him, well, let me ask you a question, I said to my friend who I was witnessing to, and he was my friend, I befriended him. And I said, um, do you believe in abortion? I knew very well he did. He said, oh yes, I believe in abortion. And I said, well listen, why do you make a distinction between Hitler murdering little children in a death camp and an abortion clinic murdering a little child while still in this mother's womb? Oh, you can't, you can't make that connection between the two? You just can't do that. The baby's, the baby's not a human being. And I asked him a question. I said, well, since you say the child isn't a human being, isn't that exactly what Hitler would say if I asked him about the Jewish people? They weren't human beings? That's exactly the excuse they used. They believed in evolution, and the Jewish people were on the far end. They weren't quite human. And he could justify murdering six million because they weren't human child in his mother's womb is the most innocent of all, and they deserve our protection. And God help these abortionists that are murdering a million babies plus a year in America alone. God help them. They will answer to God himself for murdering these children. Yes, awful, just awful. Now, 
Listen to what else Jesus says. And this is, a, this is going to end on a very high note. Listen. Even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that even one of these little ones should perish. Did you get that? It's not the will of your Father in heaven that even one should perish. What happens to a little child when he dies? A little child hasn't reached the age of reason. They go right into the presence of God. And you say, well, what do you mean by the age of reason, Jack? Well, it's an expression I get from the Word of God. And Moses brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. And before they went into the land, that generation rebelled against God in unbelief. And so God says, okay, the whole generation's got to die out in the wilderness because you wouldn't believe me. Except those 20 years of age and under, knowing not the difference between good and evil, they're going to be allowed into the land. God did not punish the children for the sins of the father. Now, I'm not saying that 20 years of age is the age of accountability. Some people, I'm sure they reach it much sooner than that, and some people, they don't reach it at all. But I know this. Jesus' death on the cross made provision for sins of people who haven't reached the age of accountability. Part of the atonement of Jesus' death was dying for sins. Dying for sins, yes, we're all sinners, but sins of unbelief is the unforgivable sin. And a little child hasn't made a decision like that. They're safe and secure in God's hands. And forget about elect and non-elect babies. It's not the will of your father that even one of these little ones perish. But it's not his will. Trust me, when a little child dies through abortion, accident, any other kind of death, don't, if you're a parent, don't worry or be concerned about where that child is. I can assure you that Jesus died for every one of them. He loves every last one of them, and they're in his presence, and they'll be there forever. How wonderful is that? As far as the pornographers are concerned, if only they knew how wonderful Jesus was, they wouldn't think for 10 seconds about walking away from a sleazy business. They wouldn't think for 10 seconds about walking away from it. As far as an example, the Lord Jesus is our great example of humbleness. Who's the greatest in the kingdom? And he calls a little child. You become like a little child, and you're converted, you're going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. The Lord Jesus, the night he was crucified and betrayed, knowing all things have been handed over to him, that all authority had been given to him by the Father. Imagine that now. The king of the universe. Everything had been given to him by the Father. He was going to go to the cross shortly. You know what he did in the upper room? They were still squabbling about which one of them was going to be the greatest. And Jesus said, I'm going to give you an example. And he took off his outer coat. And he took a basin of water. And he got down on his hands and knees and started washing the feet of the disciples. And Simon Peter says, Lord, God forbid, I'm not going to wash my dirty old feet. You're too great for that. And Jesus said, Peter, if you don't let me wash your feet, you're not going to have any fellowship with me, period. I'm giving you as an example, an example. I'm among you as the greatest, but I'm humbling myself and becoming the least, a servant. If you want to be the greatest, become a servant. Wash one another's Feet. Humble yourself. God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. I've never seen a proud child. <laughs> they're humble, and they're needy, and they're reliant. God wants you and I to be like that. And the process of sanctification will bring about those great qualities in their life. For the Spirit, one of them is meekness, meekness and gentleness. These are things that God wants to see in the life of all believers. Well, I think I'm going to leave it off there today. I'm just going to say one other thing to you. The example I gave of the thief on the cross, somebody might be thinking, well, Jack, I think I'm going to wait uh, to accept Christ and uh, maybe an hour or two before I die. The doctor tells me I've got a day or two why I can accept Jesus at that time. Don't be presumptuous with God's grace. That is a big mistake. This last year, I have uh, officiated at four funerals, Four of my friends, all of them died suddenly, quite suddenly. Now, thank God that those four were born again, and there wasn't an issue. 
But anybody that's presumptuous, I think they can put off salvation to a later date, like this thief, you don't know how long you've got to live. One of the people I gave a funeral for this year was killed by an automobile walking down the street. We have no guarantees from God. We're living in very fragile bodies. One heartbeat away from eternity. Important thing is, and the only important thing is, trusting Jesus to be our personal savior. Eternal life is a free gift. Jesus paid it all on the cross. He died and he rose again the third day. He's alive and well, and he's listening and waiting for you to call on his name. Because the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, if you're not born into God's family, don't put it off. Do it today. It'll be the most wonderful thing that ever happened to you. I want to thank you for joining us today, and may the Lord bless you. Until next time.